Hey there. I wanted to talk today about how one adjusts to and reacts to shifting influences in one's practice. And in particular, I'm thinking of events like one I've come to think of as the great spiritual handoff, which is when the central deity or archetype of one's spiritual practice changes. And the things I'm going to talk about are particularly notable and I think relevant when that change is sudden. Many of us will experience a shift over the course of our practice where our matron or patron deity may change. Or if we work with an entire pantheon, when our alignment shifts from one entity or aspect of that pantheon to another. In my own practice, how this has lately materialized for me was a very rapid introduction and handoff to a second deity. And this coincided with the arrival of Astara and the shift to the light half of the year, and very much left me with the impression that rather than interfacing with my matron for the next while, I would instead be working primarily or perhaps even exclusively with this new character that had been brought onto the scene. Now this sort of spiritual shakeup can certainly throw you off balance, but for me at least, this hasn't been in a bad way. I love the arrival of the unanticipated, and finding myself in new waters is one of the things I like best about the practice that I engage in. But in this specific scenario, I am hardly an expert. This is the first time that I've experienced this kind of rapid shift of divine influence, and I am very much still feeling the situation out. In my case, it was very clear from the jump that a lot of the details about my practice would have to change to accommodate this new influence. For instance, the way I cast circle is very much catered to the matron that I work with and is not remotely appropriate for this archetype that is entering now. How I practice spellcraft, how I design and execute my work has, with my matron, evolved to be a very intuitive, psyche-focused process. To steal a turn of phrase from a friend of mine, my practice is, by and large, very deep water. But with this new archetype, that isn't true at all. And they are, in many ways, quite the opposite of the matron I typically work with. Where she's deep water, he is haughty air, and I feel my practice being pulled in the direction of structure, high ceremony, more complex and calculated creations, where the focus is very much on the details rather than the gestalt. But there's something else I noticed too, and that was a sudden shift in the urge to interpret and interact with things in a very different way than I typically do following very different models than I typically do. And it's occurred to me that my being drawn in that direction and my feeling that the very structure of ritual and the very approach with which I interact with my practice may all be reflections of the same thing. Namely, that the different spheres of influence, interest, and relative import of following one method or another reflect differences in the way archetypes or deities think, not just what they think about. Which is to say that a shift in spiritual influence may in some cases necessarily be bound up with a shift in how one processes information. And this is the idea that I'd like to focus on today, although I am certainly still working out the details myself, but if for no other reason than to offer some perspective or hope or comfort to anybody else who has suddenly found themselves thinking in a very different way about certain aspects of their practice and wondering what the fuck is up with that. Dealing with or even discussing different ways of thinking about a similar topic is incredibly complex and quite difficult, and I feel like we necessarily end up having to leave a great deal out of this discussion, but it is one that does arise in magical circles. Chaos magic, for instance, quite famously employs belief as a tool, and this is a perspective that has been picked up by a fairly large proportion of eclectics. And there are certainly parallels here between the belief as a tool concept and what I'm experiencing, 
The notable difference being that I just found myself sort of instinctively shifting my way of thinking. The foundational assumptions upon which I built my interpretation of different practices in a largely unaware fashion, which is in stark contrast to a chaot purposefully and intentionally opting into some particular aspect of a faith. Now, belief as a tool is something I have, of course, engaged in in my practice in the past. And so I have the benefit of being able to compare and contrast that experience with what is happening now. And one of the things I'll note is that being able to opt into a belief or a framework is a skill that requires practice and effort, one that you can get better at, and one which I think, for me at least, is easier to maintain on the very short timescales that I usually engage in that sort of thing. Those timescales being on the order of hours, rather than days, weeks, or months. I also think that the efficacy of that sort of technique really benefits from not looking too closely at the process of believing. To use a very flawed analogy, the magical sausage comes out better when you don't look too closely at the ingredients that went into making it. And when we're talking about the capacity of a practice, a working, a spell, a component of that spell to influence ourselves or the world, avoiding casting too critical an eye on it sort of buffers against weakening the power of our placebos, of anything that may not be directly contributing to efficacy beyond its very specific psychological influence on us. Now, no doubt some people listening to this are familiar or have heard all the recent talk about placebos being able to influence us even when we know they're placebos. Yes, but it's more complicated than that. And at some point, I will probably provide a breakdown of the things to consider in that regard. But for now, genuinely, I do not think that there is any evidence at all to support the idea that placebos aren't more effective when you don't know they're placebos. Which is to say that genuinely believing that something will have an influence on you is more beneficial than knowing that something can have an influence on you and constantly reminding yourself that you're trying to dupe yourself into being influenced by that thing. Well, if part of your practice involves a shift in the skills, the particular skills you are developing or will be working with for the next little while, a shift in the habits of your thoughts that are related to what those skills will be may facilitate the adoption of those techniques. Alternately, if you've reached a plateau in one technique, a sudden paradigm shift may allow you to bust through that by removing the limitations inherent in the intellectual model you've been applying to that thing and supplanting it with a different model with different limitations and therefore different directions in which you can expand. It's less clear to me precisely how this sort of sudden shift in intellectual framework is triggered, but it's early days yet in my own experience, and I'm hopeful that with time I'll get a better sense of exactly what's going on and how. For the moment, though, it's a little easier to hypothesize about what the motivation for this sort of shift in intellectual framework may be, beyond the ones I've already mentioned, like exploring new fields or busting through a block. In my case, I suspect that this sudden shift in the way I'm processing certain kinds of information exists at least in part as a way to force me to act in ways and in scenarios that I have until now almost invariably refused to do. Why refused? Well, that's a byproduct of the way I conceptualized things before. And although I've spoken in the past about not allowing oneself to be too limited by the structures we impose on our own practices, there's outside of the box and then there's really outside of the box. And as much as I may make an effort to remain open-minded and adventurous, there are certainly contexts in which it's quite difficult for me to silence the inner skeptic. The arrival of a new archetype 
taking a central role in my spiritual practice, one whose arrival, for whatever reason, managed to bind and gag my inner skeptic with alarming efficiency, is, I must admit, a very effective means of removing that particular obstacle. Now, does this mean that I have to give up critical thought and critical thought forever? Of course not. As a thinking person, I have the ability to set loose that skepticism anytime I choose, as well as the ability to see that the fear that I may not be able to is a bogeyman designed to keep me from exploring new turf with an open mind. What we're talking about here isn't the death of skepticism. It's about switching up what your default mode is. Rather than starting from a place where skepticism is very difficult to overcome, I am now experiencing seeing things and exploring things from a position where skepticism isn't my knee-jerk reaction. It's still there, ready to be called upon, but now I get to experience a gamut of events and practices through new eyes. Eventually, I expect that by braiding together my experiences from these two different points of view, I will come away with a richer conceptualization of those experiences than I would have gotten by engaging with them from only one or the other viewpoint. The subjugation of that skeptical aspect of self provides me with motivation to try things that ordinarily I would write off and stands to maximize the efficacy of new placebos, whether in the form of thoughts, actions, or objects that I engage with in my practice now. To get the most out of this experience, there are a few things I think will be important for me to do and to keep in mind. For one thing, I think I need to embrace the idea that part of this process is going to involve this archetype and parts of myself aligned with this archetype trying to trick other parts of myself in order to bring out those aspects of self that will aid my progress and subdue the ones that won't. In other words, I suspect I'm going to be tempted to take things at face value and simultaneously find that I really can't. So there'll be a little bit of tricksterism going on, is what I'm saying. For example, I had a recent very intense experience that, against all rational skeptical thought, nevertheless evoked a strong sense that I had to interpret this event literally. And the call to intervene and react, given the import of this sort of event, led me to do something that I would only do in response to pressing need. Otherwise, it would have been very easy to just be like, ugh, fuck it, I'm not doing that, and basically let that entire avenue of exploration subside. But because of this weird, literal interpretation that I couldn't shake, I went and I did this thing that ordinarily I wouldn't do. Now, surprise, surprise, the thing I was concerned about literally occurring did not. But something else, tangentially related, did occur, which nevertheless serves to bolster that underlying theme of the thing I was worried about, reinforcing the direction of inquiry that I was focused on in a way that simultaneously undermines my typically skeptical view of this field as a whole without providing any support for my initial suspicions. Secondly, the urge to incorporate more ceremonial aspects, slightly different angles of approach, well, I think those are good instincts, because I think redesigning some of the aspects of my practice from scratch for the interval will help to highlight the strengths of this new influence, this new approach, this new way of thinking and facilitate the process of differentiating between what I'm holding on to because it makes sense to hold on to it from what is being held on to just because I was trying to retcon this new practice onto that old one. If the actions and stated opinions of a deity reflect their beliefs, then so too do these beliefs reflect a way of thinking. 
the subjective nature by which they view the universe itself. When we connect with deity by altering actions, objects incorporated in our practice, we do so as a means of glimpsing behind that curtain, of seeing from that point of view. And I think that from time to time, when we throw ourselves wholeheartedly at that sort of experience, well, maybe we can actually invoke and internalize the thought processes that underlie those points of view. It's not something that I expected or have experienced before, but as a spiritual exercise, it's certainly an interesting one, and I look forward to finding out where it goes. For now, though, I'd like to wish you happy spiritual travels and a wonderful afternoon.